Growing up, I've always sort of been drawn to video games in one way or another, and I've used them as a form of media consumption for as long as I can remember now. Being the youngest member of my family for a short period of time growing up also meant that I spent a significant amount of time watching older family members play video games while I sat there and gawked in awe, digesting every little thing on the screen as eagerly as you can probably imagine. I watched my two older cousins play tons of different games in my early adolescence, man. Everything from Borderlands and Tomb Raider to Skate and Fallout. But one franchise of games always seemed to have caught my eye and has stuck with me more than any other when I was lucky enough to witness them being played, and it was Rockstar Games' very own Grand Theft Auto series. When I was younger, I honestly only liked the idea of being enclosed inside of a virtual city with the sole intent of causing as much chaos and surviving for as long as humanly possible. So the GTA games seemed like a perfect way for me to simulate this odd enthrallment of mine. I genuinely didn't care for the story at all when I was playing these games as a kid, and as I keep getting older and have begun to value writing more, I can't help but wonder how I was able to push these stories aside for as long as I did. Practically every one of these games that were released on 6th generation consoles and up have damn near become gaming's equivalent to cinematic masterpieces. Every individual one of them strived so profusely to match such a unique and carefully crafted tone that one could argue their hard work and dedication has made them all stand out as iconic experiences that can be revisited at any point in time. Long before the franchise was able to gain the recognition of the cultural icon it is known as today though, it, just like any form of media, had to start from somewhere, and the Grand Theft Auto series is no stranger to unusual origins. Before Grand Theft Auto, or even the name Rockstar Games, was a thought in anyone's head, the company was founded in 1987 as a DMA designed by David Jones, who very quickly went on to hire his former classmates Mike Daly, Russell Kay, and Steve Hammond as fellow game designers. In their younger years as a development studio, they released a vast quantity of games during the time span of 1988 to 1993 that aren't too notable nowadays, but one game stood out compared to the rest, and it was their 1991 hit, Lemmings. This game opened a lot of doors for the young and promising studio. One door in particular partially led to them acquiring a publishing deal with Nintendo in the latter half of 1994. Yes, you heard that right. Technically, at one point in time, Rockstar Games were officially published under Nintendo, and while this bizarre partnership was active, they developed and released Uni Rally in the UK and Uni Racers in the US in 1995. This game was the studio's first attempt at tackling the racing genre that was officially released to the public, but behind the scenes, DMA had been working on a game that was giving them a lot of trouble. But, unbeknownst to them, it was about to be one of the greatest things the studio ever worked on, and their hard work would certainly go on to implement their names into video game history. And if you're still curious about that Nintendo side story, their partnership fell flat in 1998 when DMA released the game Body Harvest to Nintendo's disapproval, but that's another story. Behind the scenes, Dave Jones and Mike Daly had been working on a prototype for a game they codenamed Race and Chase, which was essentially an open-world action-adventure game with the idea of letting players play as cops or criminals that could run around and participate in various tasks slash activities of their choice around a virtual city, 
in sort of a cops and crooks style of gameplay, but they ran into a lot of hurdles pretty fast when actually developing the game itself. I'm sure everybody has already heard the legend of how Race and Chase eventually evolves into Grand Theft Auto. That story's been echoing on the internet for years now, but in case you didn't know, I'll explain it real quick. In the original design document for Race and Chase, the main draw-in for the cops team was how they could pull over criminals and arrest them. That was until one fateful day when an error in one of the police cars' coding caused them to ram into the criminals' cars instead of just pulling them over, and to the devs' surprise, this inadvertently made the game a whole lot more fun. Thus, plans changed, and Grand Theft Auto was born in one stroke of bad code. There's a joke to be made in there somewhere, I'm sure. But that wasn't the only reason David and Mike decided to change things up, though. Rumor has it they were also having trouble making it actually fun for the cops team in general. At first, the idea was to have the police team obey traffic laws, but that very quickly became boring and unbalanced considering how the criminal team got to do all the fun things. So the whole playing as the cops idea in general was scrapped in favor of the game being a more racing crime simulator. Which was kind of rare in the late 90s all things considered. I always wondered how a game like Grand Theft Auto was able to grab everyone's attention back in the day, but now after doing a little bit of research, it turns out it was all because of two brothers over at their new publisher, BMG Interactive. Dan and Sam Hauser have probably become household names to some diehard Rockstar fans, but what a lot of people might not know is how they were responsible for hiring ex-publicist Max Clifford to tip off a few major news headlines about a brand new violent video game that was about to hit the market in 1997 and consume the minds of children. This wild strategy ended up working in the favor of GTA in the long run, as it was basically free marketing and publicity to thousands of homes across America. But it did come close to backfiring, as other members of BMG Interactive had no idea about this secret transaction when it first happened, and almost pulled Grand Theft Auto off the shelves when they heard about the media frenzy it was causing. But in this world, I guess all publicity really is good publicity because even though the game ended up being released to mix reviews, it still went on to sell around a million copies worldwide in the first year alone. And the individual praises critiques were giving it was for its unique sound design, detailed graphics, for 1997 standards anyway, and of course how free the open world felt and entertaining it was to revisit. It's still kind of wild for me to think that this was the game that would eventually come to set the standard for open world video games in the future. Up until a whopping five days ago, I had never really played the original Grand Theft Auto, but thanks to Rockstar giving it out as freeware a few years back, I was able to download and play the original 1997 DOS box version, so that's what gameplay you'll be seeing in the background of this video. When booting the game up, you'll be greeted with a shockingly dated but kind of memorable graphic at the main menu, accompanied by a theme song that was designed specifically for this game. This logo was the one to start it all. It's not very visually appealing, I'll admit, but it definitely does a good job of capturing the atmosphere that this game has to offer, and I can definitely see how the main menu having its own theme song went on to inspire games like Saints Row to do the same thing in the near future. This one song composed by Craig Connor and the rest of DMA's small sound team was such a hit within the staff in general that it basically paved the foundation for music as a whole in GTA. The developers really liked the idea of having a wide variety of music accessible to the players via several different genre-specific radio stations. Every individual type of vehicle is tied to a certain radio station that starts playing as soon as you enter it too, with race cars playing more intense, fast-paced electronic tracks on head radio or the Fix FM, muscle cars playing hard slash alternative rock on Unleashed FM, and my personal favorite out of them all, the pickup truck plays a station titled The Fergus Buckner Show FM. This station is solely my favorite, not because I enjoy country music over everything else, no, but because there is only one country song in the entire game, and the board op behind the mic uses this opportunity to poke fun by saying, Oh yeah, going all the way back there. 
That was the ballad of Chap Lips Calhoun by the late Sideways Hank O'Malley and the Alabama Bottle Boys. And you know, that was so good, I reckon I'll play it again. That might not be that funny to everybody who's listening right now, but I am not ashamed at all to admit that I almost blew a goddamn gasket when I listened to that mediocre bit the first time. Most of the music that's in this game wouldn't have been possible without the help of local talent either. James Wilson told TimeExtension.com in an interview that Connor approached him after hearing about him through his local university connections and pitched the idea of him recording a few tracks for a video game he was working on, to which James was more than willing to help. He ended up rapping the vocals on that intro song I showed earlier and ended up giving his voice to all the police officers you hear around the game. He even delivers the iconic busted line when the player gets caught by the police Failing in Grand Theft Auto can happen in one of two ways. You can either get wasted, which occurs when the player dies from gunfire, falls in water, etc. Or you could get busted, which is when the cops catch up to the player while they have a wanted level and arrest them. Either way, when you fail, you will lose all weapons that you've accumulated so far and will be teleported to the nearest police station or hospital. The wanted levels operate on a 1-4 to four star system in this game, with the aggression of the police getting stronger with every new star acquired. The first two are just police cars pursuing you, but after three they start to set up roadblocks and become harder to avoid. The only way to lose the police in this game is by visiting one of the various pay and sprays that are available in random parts of each map. On paper this does sound like a good idea, but in reality it just makes the chase sequences drag out more and I'm very happy to say this function gets reworked eventually. In its early days, GTA was trying way harder to be an arcade game opposed to the realistic crime shooter the series has evolved into today, and that philosophy is very apparent in the first title. There are special crates scattered around each one of the three unique maps you can play, and every one of them gives you some kind of power-up or weapon the player can use to their own benefit, some even spawning kill frenzies, which just do nothing but increase your score. This incentivizes players to explore the map and memorize the spawn locations of necessary items, but then the problem occurs when you realize how terrible the maps are actually laid out. There isn't a mini-map or anything like that, just a rinky-dink yellow marker that points you towards your active mission. But if you don't memorize where the limited number of bridges are, navigating through the city becomes very tedious very fast. The game does come with a map, but in my case, to access it you'll have to find it in the documents folder of the game and put it in a second monitor to use it as effectively as possible. I can see how this was a cool idea in the past, because people who purchased the PS1 version of the game got a cool poster map they could read along while they play, or hang up as a poster. But as time progresses, this method doesn't hold up as much as a built-in map would've, in my opinion. Unlocking the maps themselves depends on the extent of your story progression between any of the eight starting characters available to play. None of them are memorable or even make another appearance outside of this game, but hey, they look pretty goofy to say the least. The story itself is probably the worst part of this game, if I'm being honest. No matter which one of the eight playable characters you decide to pick at the start of the game, the story follows a ruthless, nameless criminal that rises their way through the ranks of various crime syndicates that operate throughout various cities and causes nothing but chaos along the way. One thing I instantly noticed about this GTA compared to the others is how it chooses to focus on making fun of American culture more than giving you a narrative device, like a protagonist for example, to engage in the world of American culture yourself. That's not even a bad thing either, it was just an interesting choice in my opinion. If you can bear through the rough introduction and overlook the classic tank-like controls most PC games of the late 90s had, you might even find yourself having a blast here and there though, especially if side-scrolling platformers are your cup of tea. Plus, there's a burp and fart button, so you pretty much have more than you could ask for already. This game even opens up with an announcer saying, Grand Theft Auto. Which gives the game a classic kind of retro game show-esque vibe while you realize you're wandering through the streets of a completely 2D rendered version of Liberty City. Their very first interpretation of it at that too. DMA Design originally had hopes of making this first entry a 3D game, but considering the amount of money that would cost and how they were still a fairly small studio at the time, 
they had to scrap this idea in favor of 2D graphics. But the game was still modeled and rendered in 3D before that decision was made. So you can actually find footage on YouTube of what Grand Theft Auto might have looked like in one point in time. One problem this game suffers from tremendously in the first half is the poor mission structure. Or rather, how lazy most of these missions are designed. But thankfully, they become more lenient as the game goes on. Almost every one of them at first just makes the player go from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. But depending on how confusing the map is to understand, this time can feel extremely restricting. Now once you've completed enough of them though, or get your score in the top right corner to 1 million or past 2 million points, you'll get a random phone call telling you to show up at a random place and a cutscene will play, allowing you to progress onto the next chapter. The cutscenes themselves are the only time any kind of story gets implied or semi-explained to the player at all, and most of them aren't even a minute long, so nothing of true value ever really gets said. It feels like their true purpose was to be a short moment of comedic relief for the player as they play the game extensively, and if that is the case, then they hit the nail on the head for sure. No character in any one of these cutscenes ever makes another cameo in any of the other GTA games, and they aren't very memorable. They are essentially just parodies of mob bosses and drug lords alike. Some of the dialogue in this game has aged rather poorly, but all things considered, nothing blatantly racist is ever said or outright implied, but there are some character designs that come off as morally gray to say the least. There was this one mission though that caught me off guard while I was two hours deep into a gaming session that involves this member of the triads that is so ashamed of his actions, he took the fundamentals of GTA and hid them, but before deleting himself from history, he gives us their location. An argument can definitely be made about how disgraceful the intro to this mission is, but as I continued to play and hunted down the secret ingredients of GTA, this actually turned into my favorite mission during the, my entire playthrough. It really felt like the devs were reaching their hands out and speaking to me directly as if to say, Hey man, we get it. That was kind of repetitive, now try this. Because at the time of me playing this part, I was doing nothing but complaining and bitching my way through the entire game. This one mission was such an eye-opener for me personally, because it allowed me to take a step back and admire the things I was witnessing while I was exploring the map, without having to worry about some kind of shitty time restriction. This inadvertently broke the gameplay loop I was accidentally stuck in. That was, go to this payphone and do that, now go to that payphone and do this, etc. If more of the earlier missions were designed like this, I probably wouldn't even be writing this down right now. For this mission, you have to search the entire map like an easter egg hunt looking for specific briefcases, and it was a very nice breath of fresh air. It almost seemed like the developers realized how terrible missions were at first too, because not only do they poke fun at themselves with the narrative of this mission, but after this, most if not all missions change for the better. There are still a few timed payphone missions that appear here and there, but for the most part, the majority of missions become far less annoying after this point in the game. Another one even has you ride on a subway train that is rigged to blow and the mission complete announcement only appears after the train is blown up and you're already wasted. So you can tell the developers were just throwing things at the wall to see if they stick at some point. I really wish I was able to complete this game or even unlock the Vice City map itself, but due to the lack of saving options combined with a clunky progression system, and some missions in San Andreas' Chapter 2 just straight up crashing my game and soft locking me, I wasn't able to, unfortunately. I played through this whole game twice and this issue kept occurring. Maybe if I would have played in glide mode we'd be hearing things differently right now, but that's just wishful thinking, honestly. Either way, here it is. This is DMA slash Rockstar Games' first attempt at a Vice City, footage courtesy of GTA series videos on YouTube. The Vice City map is far more colorful and appears to be significantly smoother and easier to navigate compared to San Andreas or Liberty City. The placements of payphones, input yards, and even power-ups have seemed to be given a lot more thought when designing this map, and it makes me really excited to see what Rockstar has in mind for Vice City in GTA 6. This map still suffers from some of the same problems as the other maps though. 
Fences are still practically impossible to notice while driving at high speeds on a bird's eye view 2D camera. And speaking of the camera, it practically becomes unusable when near buildings. Thankfully, these issues only ever happened once in a blue moon and weren't consistent enough for me to think this game was unplayable. In truth, uh, Grand Theft Auto was so playable that two years after its initial release, the player base was consistent enough for them to receive a surprise expansion pack in the spring of 1999. Sometime after the commercial success of Grand Theft Auto, DMA Design was officially purchased by a publishing company known as Take-Two Interactive and were forced to undergo a change of management. That eventually resulted in the company being rebranded into Rockstar North. During this rebranding and relocation of offices, the company lost a lot of the staff that worked on the first game, but the Hauser brothers remained key members of the company. Shortly after all that drama, the team immediately began working on some extra content for Grand Theft Auto, partly due to how well it sold, but mainly as a means of promotion for their upcoming sequel, Grand Theft Auto 2, that was set to release in the fall of that same year. Two expansion packs were released separately on GTA 2's website for PC players, but PlayStation 1 players were able to purchase the first pack in a surprise bundle known as the Grand Theft Auto London Special Edition. Mission Pack 1 itself actually won a fucking BAFTA award in the UK for its unique sound design, if you can believe that, with multiple critiques saying the expansion did a superb job with its clever reworking of the original sounds to fit the period slash setting of a 1969 London. For example, getting busted changed to getting nicked, the sirens and car horns were swiped for their British counterparts, and the entire radio was given a brand new British themed overhaul as well. And all of that is before I even mention how visually appealing London looks, or even how good it feels to actually play. The chapter progression system is still the same alongside with all the other mechanics in the base game, but the requirements for advancement are far less egregious in this version compared to the regular game. Most of the missions you'll be playing are still triggered through period accurate payphones that are scattered around the city, and they still make you do the same tasks as before, either making you follow around a guy for a few minutes before taking him out, or another classic timed trial. But thankfully, London isn't nearly as hard to traverse as the other cities. London has a unique color palette to it as well that really makes it pop in its own special kind of way. Not too vibrant, but not too grimacy either. Not only are there new car models, but the buildings and the layout of the city were designed to match some famous British architecture and to match UK road patterns. A few new cutscenes with some wacky characters and a new story were also added, but just like before, it's nothing really to write home about. The only difference really comes when you pick one of the eight new playable characters with funny British names like Rodney Muresh to play the game with. The true fun doesn't arrive until the very next mission pack. Mission Pack 2 follows the same cast of British characters as before, but it takes place eight years prior to the first one chronologically as a prequel, sort of, in a 1961 rendition of London. This expansion was only made available to PC players, and it adds one new cutscene, 22 new cars, drive-by shooting mechanics, and a brand new multiplayer deathmatch mode that came with one map based on the real life city of Manchester in the UK. This was the series' first look at any kind of online multiplayer, but it was only available to those who wanted to go through the trouble of setting up their own servers through the IPX protocol. Technically, you could still play this if you really wanted to today, but as you could imagine, I was not able to record any footage of it during the writing or recording of this video in 2024. Mainly because even if I was able to find someone who still played this game enough and was willing to host a server, I would still have to give them my full IP address just to connect and play, but I digress. Drive-by mechanics were something I was not expecting to be included into this DLC, but I couldn't be happier that they were. The controls for them are still tankier than I'd hoped for, but at least they improve as the franchise continues to expand in the future. If you still wanted to experience the first GTA today, but didn't want to necessarily see everything, I would highly recommend that you play the second expansion pack. This version of the game still requires you to have the other two, but it feels like everything the original game was supposed to be. 
The missions and chapters are way easier to complete and the narrative is much more clear. Plus, being able to commit drive-by shootings combined with the ability to put armor on vehicles not only gives the player new ways to approach missions, but it makes a huge difference to how gameplay functions in general in this game. The only thing that might be a little hard to overlook is the actual setting of a real-life London compared to the fictional US-based cities the players might be used to already, but considering how no other GTA game ever chooses to revisit this area, you might as well see it while you can, right? I wasn't expecting London to be any different than San Andreas or Liberty City, but I couldn't have been more wrong in that assumption, honestly. It feels like everyone at Rockstar Games and previously DMA Design were listening to all the fans' criticism over the few short years this game was out. Just about every complaint I had with the OG Grand Theft Auto was addressed and reworked in some way or another, just for the player's convenience. This is almost a given in the gaming industry nowadays, but in 1999, it was very rare to see game developers understand fan feedback and deal with it as quickly as this. All in all, I can say I found myself enjoying the original Grand Theft Auto and its DLC a whole lot more than I anticipated I would. Sure, this game isn't a certified banger by any means, but it still holds value as an action-adventure title, and whether you want to admit it or not, it birthed the series of games that would eventually go on to revolutionize open world games as a whole. Now that Rockstar had established a rough foundation with Grand Theft Auto, they wanted to push as many limits as they could when setting out to make Grand Theft Auto 2.